We call the meeting to order at 4 o'clock. If we could take a minute to uh, introduce ourselves, start with Jennifer. Jennifer Gossick, City Clerk. Matt Zacker, uh, Committee Chair, District 3 Alderman. Dennis Pollock, City Alderman. Dean Veneman, um, Committee Member, uh, Council President. Jay Bamke, District 8, Committee Member. Shane Blazer, Mayor. Finance Director. Tim DeSorcy, Finance Director. Thank you. Item two, review and consider for approval of the shared ride taxi operating contract and public transit lease agreement between the City of Wisconsin Rapids and Running Incorporated. Tim. Sure, as, as everyone's aware that, you know, um, the city as required by the states every five years, we have to go out and request proposals for a share ride taxi program. Um, we went through that process and the, the contract was awarded to Running Incorporated and this, uh, the contract before you is the five-year operating contract for that award. Thank you. Could you take a minute and explain the the objective uh, measures that were used in order to come to this um, agreement? I'll take the, thank you. The criteria that was given to us to follow by the state, um, let me get to that page. So we had to form an evaluation committee of um, four members of our council. And our instructions were to evaluate those factors on the professional competence of the bids that we received, um, the capacity of the company, if they could actually perform the services that we were asking, and then their experience. So based on that criteria, our evaluation committee met on October 12th and again on the 19th. And we went through that criteria. Scores were given to each proposal and the total of those scores came out with Running Inc. Um, as the winner of the bid. And did I understand that this was all done before the bids, the, the money was ever opened and looked Correct. at and talked about? Yep, we have to do the criteria on the proposals prior to looking at what the actual monetary bid was. Okay. Um, was there, okay, so, so nobody knew what the price was for each, each of the bids that were put in. Correct. Everything was objective in terms of how it was written out and, and uh, quantified. And then when, so we don't, we don't, we as a city, as a municipality, we don't have a choice to accept one or the other. It's, it's not subjective to who we want. Correct. Once the bidding or the scoring was completed, those scores were submitted to the state. And then once the state um, had the final total scores, then with Running Inc. being the person that had the highest score, that's who we have to award the contract to. Okay, so we don't have a choice as we to who. We can't say no, this isn't who we want at this point. Okay. So there's no way we can do that. This is, this is just the way the process goes. Well, we goes. could, but then we wouldn't get the grant funding. We would, so there's state and federal grant funding that we wouldn't get at all. Correct. So then we wouldn't have a service, Correct. basically. Yep. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. At this point, um, Jay, go ahead. So uh, what's the grant total? Do you know off the top of your head? Um, based on, if, you know, depending on, based on the RFP, the amounts for the drive. So the contract award is based on a bid rate times the number of driver hours. Um, so based on what was in the RFP of 41,184 driver hours, um, the state and federal funding for running e the, the state and federal funding comes up to about $822,000. Thank you. So basically the, the federal and state funding 
fund about 54.7% of the contract amount. Okay. Any other questions? Right. At this point, I would like to open it up. If anybody did have something to say, I guess our, our hope is to try to explain um, where the city came to this crossroads um, in the change of um, who's going to be running the taxi service in Wisconsin Rapids. So if somebody does want to come up at this time, um, please state your name and address and make sure the mic uh, green button is lit up. It's working. Uh, my name is Richard Bender. I'm the president of the Board of Wheels of Independence, who uh, is the umbrella company that owns River City Cab and has uh, maintained the cab service for the last 15 or 20 years for the city. Uh, we were one of uh, two bidders uh, for the five-year contract. Um, we were given a copy of the uh, evaluation and award process procedure. We were also given copies of the scoring. And in reading through the uh, process here, I question whether uh, the process was flawed in such a way that um, the decision that has been made uh, may be voidable because there is a very specific procedure that has to be followed in order for the evaluation to be a valid one. Uh, it's my understanding that the evaluation committee was uh, composed of three of the aldermen. And uh, as the uh, directions say, the proposals are independently evaluated. Each uh, committee member uh, scores on those categories that were um, set forth uh, earlier. And then there's some sort of discussion that is supposed to take place after the scores are tabulated. Uh, I'm just going to read from the uh, scoring of those technical proposals uh, from the directions that we were given. It says, uh, the chair of the evaluation committee will convene a meeting of the evaluation committee to reach a consensus score for each of the offers or each of the bidders. Consensus scoring is intended to facilitate an open discussion among the evaluators as to the strengths and or weaknesses of each of the offers proposal based upon the solicitation's technical evaluation factors. So it doesn't appear as if this second meeting, the second evaluation, where the committee members actually reached a consensus number, a consensus score, uh, was had. Uh, the importance of having this consensus factor is that let's say that we have three people on the committee and one scores a six and the other two score a, a one. I mean, if you merely uh, added up the scores, they would come to eight. If you then average them, they would be somewhere in the neighborhood of two point something. But is two point something really the score? If you had a consensus and two people scored at one and one person scored at six, wouldn't the consensus likely or, or possibly be one instead of two point something? So our point is that unless the committee followed the technical instructions that were given, we believe that the decision is flawed in that there was never a consensus score determined by the committee. It's not merely just average, you know, adding the numbers up and dividing by three. So I'd like the committee to uh, let us know what, what they did after the independent evaluations were made, when the meeting was that they reached a consensus, if in fact there was such a meeting, 
Um, so I'd like the, the committee to speak to that if they could. We held our first meeting on October 12th um, after the committee had already scored their, uh, went through the technical scoring. So we did talk and discuss the scores at that time. And then we averaged those scores. So everybody, we talked about it. We went through both of the proposals. Everything was discussed in length. And then we averaged the scores of all four of the committee members. So there was, you're telling me that, that uh, the score you came up with was really just the average. It wasn't, uh, I guess yep. what. The, the we followed the procedures that were given to us by the state. Everything that we did along the way was sent to the state, had to be approved by the state before we could move to the next process. So as we completed these steps, this, it was approved by the state before we could even issue the uh, intent to award. This all had to be sent to the state. They reviewed all of our score sheets and they reviewed the scores and then they determined that we could move on with our intent to award. We're not questioning, you know, the presentation to the state. My question is, there doesn't appear to have been a consensus score that resulted from what the instructions say were an open discussion. All, all the committee did was average them, which, as a, in my example, uh, could have resulted in a flawed number if you just average them is that really a consensus? No, I don't think so. And I, I suspect that many don't. We followed the instructions we were given. Was there any alteration other than the averaging of the numbers? No. To, okay. So you didn't actually assign a consensus number other than the average. We discussed their individual scores and then each committee member had a total score based on the three technical criteria that we had to follow. And then those scores were averaged. So if one, one committee member had scored it a one and one had scored it a five, there was no uh, discussion or there was no attempt to convince the five we did that have it discussions have been a one? yep we had two meetings that this was discussed at October 12th and October 19th and everybody was able to voice their opinions as to how they scored it the way they did some people did score you know opposite of the other but we discussed all of that but nobody changed their mind in terms of the score no So did the consensus come out of the first meeting or the second? The second meeting. Okay, well, I guess you've answered my question. Thank you. Uh, Ken, Ken Porter. Um, I'm one of the board members for Wheels of Independence and, and, and overseeing River City Cab. Address, if you need it, is 442 uh, Heritage Trail, 4442 Heritage Trail. So that's out in the town of Seneca, so you guys don't have to worry. I can't vote for you anyway. So, But I, I, we do have a couple additional questions. Uh, we're taking this matter very seriously, and, and I do want to exp express that I really appreciate the committee members for serving, the council members for serving. This is a tough job. I've served in a couple uh, you know, town positions, and kind of thankless so please please don't think we're uh, criticizing you personally but we are concerned about this process I've been involved at, from Lamers bus lines in numerous requests for proposal and I just have a couple of concerns about the process um, and again it, it sounds like the, the RFP the request for proposal is created by the DOT or is it created by the city or a combination of the two 
combination of the two. They give us the, the template to follow. And then as it's completed, then I sent it to the state and had to get their approval before I could even post it out for bid. Okay. I'm just going to point out a couple of things in addition to what Rick pointed out. We're being, you're being told, we're being told that price, the bid, had nothing to do with the evaluation. Yet I am looking at what's, what's called the Evaluation Committee Consensus Rating Summary Sheet. And on this sheet, there is a price score. Section, uh, uh, letter two, price score is assigned by the Evaluation Committee. So I'm, I'm looking at this. This is the evaluation sheet, and price is on here. So this would be an indication to me that price, that the, the bids were opened After. prior. No. We had to then completely can, score then, everything before we opened the sealed bids. How, how can you have a price score if you didn't open the bids? Sure. Basically, <clears throat> the first three criteria are evaluated and scored. And once those scores are arrived at, then the sealed bids are open. And then I do believe 30 points is awarded to the lowest bid and, and 24, 24 points to the second lowest bid. Then those are tallied to come up with your final score. Is, is, the, is, that, is that part of what's sent to the DOT? Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not understanding how price then isn't part, that the bid wasn't part of the evaluation. Well, well, I, I understand what you're yeah. saying. If, the initial criteria was evaluated, and then the bids were open, but then that's part of what goes to the DOT. So that, was that part of what the DOT considered, the bid? Yes. Is everyone aware what the, what the bid difference was? We were 16% lower over a five-year period of the contract. That's over a million dollars. That's pretty significant. I'm having a hard time saying that that can't be part of the process. We're being told that's not part of the process, yet I see that to be relatively valuable. A couple other things in regard to how some of the evaluation criteria, and I know we can't change that, it's sent in, it was agreed on by everybody, but as financial documents and financial stability of the companies was an important consideration, and, and we received a bit of a lesser score in that criteria. Appendix G, under the standard terms and conditions of the of the request for proposal indicates substantiate their financial stability by submitting either a letter from propos proposer's bank or auditor. Financial statements and documents should not, capitalize not, accompany the bank letter. We submitted a bank letter based on this statement, and yet we were heavily do docked, I'll say, heavily penalized for not providing better financial documents. I, I can't see how that could happen or how, that, how that, there, there could be that disparity. Another part of the evaluation was the fleet. We received a lesser evaluation, lesser points on, on that part of it. The fleet is basically owned by the city. How, how can, I'm, I'm not even sure how that even could be considered a, a part of the criteria. So I, I, I just, uh, after uh, 38 years of, of Wheels of Independence, being in this city, our experience speaks for itself. We have 33 employees that, that got us through COVID, that have been dedicated to this city. I real, everybody's saying here that we cannot be subjective on this, that there's a black and white process, that the process has been completed and submitted and finalized, yet, when, when Mr. DeSorcy sent the uh, uh, press release to the paper, there it says pending common council approval. Is that just a rubber stamp? Apparently it is. I, I don't see that as a good, a good process. And I, I apologize for the criticism. Again, not criticizing any of you, but the process really appears to be flawed. And again, here we are in a, get that thing out of my way. We're here in a committee meeting, and you're apparently approving it as well. What are you approving if it's, if it's a done deal? And I, I just don't see that as, as a, there's got to be an over, some overseeing by the entire council of the evaluation committee, in, in my opinion. Of course, my opinion and many of ours. <laughs> so I'll repeat it once again. A million dollars over a five-year period 
16% lower. I, I just don't see that as a healthy thing uh, for, you know, for, for our community. Um, we, we did our best. We're, we're a, we're a not-for-profit. We have, we, like I said, we have served, uh, we've, we've been doing the cab since 2001, I believe. 1999. 1999. So, you know, almost 25 years of, of service. I think our experience speaks for itself. I, I guess what I'm saying in summary is I don't quite understand how the evaluations could have been, you know, that much in disparity. You know, so I, I'll start repeating myself here. <laughs> so, I'll, so I'll just sit down again and maybe ask for a couple of comments. But I think you can see some of the points that I've made are, are relatively valid, valid. And again, if this is a done deal, I guess the, what I at least want to do is make sure that this process is improved for the future. Uh, it's, it's relatively important. And we've got numerous, numerous employees here, including two staff members that are going to be affected. Uh, we have four dispatchers. Again, hopefully running, if, if, if this is a done deal and running comes in, hopefully many of our drivers can be employed. I've been involved in this community for, for quite a while, trying to help it through the Sports Commission, et cetera. Uh, Jay, you and I have worked on numerous things like that. Matt, you, you and I go way back on some of the heart of Wisconsin stuff. We're trying to rebuild this community, and I believe we're going to rebuild it from medium-sized businesses. We have a really solid medium-sized business here that, that is being affected pretty severely. Um, again, I understand RFPs very well. I know there's some clandestine stuff with RFPs. You can't do this, you can't do that. Most of them are written so that um, the agency that's, that's, that's asking for the RFPs ha has a way to change it if they want to. Again, we haven't had full board approval. We haven't had this committee approval. I'm hoping that there's a way that we can fix this, reverse this, because I think it's relatively important. So th thanks for your time, for your efforts on this. But uh, I, I, just, I just felt we needed to you know, talk about that process a little bit. Hello, Jim Brown. Uh, I'm the current manager for River City Cab. Uh, I'm at 2320 Kingston Road. And I just wanted to say thank you. you all these people here are employees there. And um, you, the decision is what it is. But this is how concerned they are. And they're the best of the best. I wish the next uh, management luck. Because if you lose this, you lose them. They're a family to us. and. Uh, I think the issue I found with all this was um, I think the next time this comes up, ask more questions regarding de the details of what we do. Nobody ever came to me and said, Jim, what do you do? How does this work? Uh, I know the mayor, we've worked a long time, so you know how this, how this works, but uh, there's going to be some changes coming, and uh, I hope for the best. But I'm concerned. Uh, like I said, I know some of these people aren't going to be with the running incorporated, and that's going to hurt. It's going to hurt the city. You're going you're to be probably getting some, some concerns from, other, from the general public. But again, thank you to all of them. I love working with them. I'm going to miss them. And uh, so I wish them luck. Thanks. Excuse me, if I, I'm not going to make it through this without crying. My name is Carlene Dillingham. This is my son, Tyler Cowan. He's worked for River City Cab for six years. He has special needs. When ODC shut the doors and said we had to leave ODC and their nice facility they had, this family welcomed him in. He got you through COVID by cleaning your cabs and making sure that this community was kept safe. That's his role. Jim has been a wonderful boss to him, and it's a family or organization. Unfortunately, on this application, 
that Runnings gave him to apply, he's not eligible to apply. Under the American Disabilities Act, that is wrong. He can't apply because he can't live in Barocca because he has to be in this community where he is kept safe. That makes me very angry. He can't apply because he's not a driver. That's the only two positions they have. He can't drive because he has epilepsy. He cleans your cabs. They transport him to and from work. This has to be considered under the American Disabilities Act. I'm very angry. I don't know if there's anybody from running here, but this is not an application that should go out to any job. Thank you. Darby Robinson, 1340 Airport Avenue. I just want to know one question. Whereabouts did the committee decide come up with this extra million dollars? Is it going on our city taxes as taxpayers without a voice? Is it coming from a different fund? Where's it coming from? Anybody? Tim? Yeah, I mean, over the five year, with, with the bid rates that came in, uh, the increase in the contract is the $1,036,000. 567000 of that will be covered by the federal and state funding because they cover 54.7% okay. of that. So the, the additional cost over the five years, assuming, you know, I'm just looking at a three-year average of revenues at this point is like $469,000. So for the, for the first year, it, it's an increase of, of $90,000 for the 2024 contract okay. operating year. And where is the city coming up with that? Is that going the, on city taxes as far as property owners? Is it going toward, to all the businesses? Um, yeah, the $90,000 will have to come out of the 2024 budget. We have some operating reserves in there to cover it for this upcoming year. But yeah, in future years, that increase will have to be come out of the budget. But, you know, as you may be aware that we're, we're limited in how much our levy can be. So, you know, we can't raise our levy necessarily just to make up that difference. We may have to find it in other parts of our budget. Or if, if revenues come in better than expected, that'll reduce that amount. So potentially it could add more to job taxpayer. Well, with levy limits, our levy is capped at a certain amount. We can't go above that. So even though that we may have additional expenditures of X, Y, and Z above and beyond what our, our levy is allowed, we can't raise the levy to cover that. So that means if we don't have additional revenues to cover it, we may have to find it in different parts of our budget. Thanks for not letting the taxpayers have a voice on that one. I'm Julie Stren. I'm the president and CEO at ODC. Um, so our business is 1191 Huntington. I actually live at 7323 Richfield Wood Road in Arpen. Um, I just wanted to share that um, over the last four years that I've been the president and CEO at ODC, but actually in my entire um, career uh, for working for Wood County and um, the state of Wisconsin, um, and currently at ODC working at 12 different counties, um, there is something special about Wisconsin Rapids and the partnership that we have um, and we've been honored to have with Ridi River City Cabs and Wheels for Independence that doesn't exist in other communities. Um, transportation is a really interesting um, area that uh, is always on the docket, like there's never enough transportation, transportation is always a struggle. And um, I think part of the reason why we've seen more success here than in other areas and other counties that we might provide support and 
currently we provide support to over a thousand people every year in the 12 counties um, is because of the relationship and partnership we've had with River City and Wheels. And so I'm not saying that we can't develop a partnership with a new organization, but I, I just wanted to, um, to vocalize that. And whenever there has been a challenge around how do we support individuals that have disabilities getting to and from work or to and from in and out of town, it's always been a collaborative approach of sitting down with Jim and saying, you know, what routes can we do? And, and what can they do to really come together as a community? And um, I just, I, I feel like they deserve um, that to be heard um, in this process of um, the, the commitment to really coming together as a community. So again, I, you have a hard decision and um, thank you so much for letting us speak today and just giving some of that feedback and we really appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Lisa Flagg, and I am the Office Manager for Wheels of Independence. I have questions in regards to the evaluation process. Um, it is regarding the fleet. It was listed, or when we sent it in, we did list all of the fleet and the vehicles that we use um, for the service of the transportation. When we questioned the vehicles and the requirements, we received city-owned vehicles are not defined by this requirement. Yet when the evaluation came through, we were docked many points for that. Then with Running Inc, apparently um, on the evaluation scores, one of the members that evaluated stated that they would have liked a list of the vehicles that Running Inc were using. So we sent in the list, Running Inc. did not. They didn't get docked, we did. To me, that is not a fair evaluation. Running Inc. did have a list of vehicles in their proposal. The person that did that scoring just did not find them at that time. It was discussed later at one of our meetings but we did not change the scoring. Then if the city-owned vehicles are not a requirement or not defined for this requirement, why will we dock so many points? That I can't speak to. I didn't do any scoring. Okay. Anyone that did the scoring, can they maybe answer why we were docked for that when we were told that it wasn't a requirement because we use the, the vehicles from the city? Do you remember that? Do you remember that? Go ahead. I don't remember. Hi, yes. I'm Patrick Delaney. I mm -hmm. was on the committee. Um, so the, the requirements as far as the RFP goes, um, as far as me personally, I docked you and I also docked running incorporated. They did have a list and what I was speaking at on that was they did not define what vehicles the city was going to be using on their list. They did provide a list and you were both docked points for it Okay. as far as me personally. Yeah, based on the RFP criteria. Okay. So the city-owned vehicles are not defined by this requirement. We were docked to a 4. They were docked to a 10. I don't see that. We're told that we, it's not defined by that requirement, and we were docked significantly less or scored less than what they did. It doesn't make sense. We're being told that it shouldn't be a requirement shouldn't be defined, but yet we have been docked severely for it in a couple of categories. In the professional competence as well as the capacity, we were docked for the fleet. And it just doesn't make sense. If we're told that the city owned 
vehicles are not defined, why are we docked? Especially in, we're two categories, we were docked for it. Which in essence is probably the difference of us losing the bid to not losing it. I just don't think it's a fair evaluation. And I think it, as Jim had said, going forward in the future, I think that is something that definitely needs to be looked at because I don't think that's correct or fair for our company who has been here for this city for so many years. Thank you. I guess all I can say is on my score, I'm pretty sure you received a higher score than running from me in many of those categories. Karen, do you have the RFP in front of you that can you can read the vehicle fleet description that uh, what's put out by the state on what the scoring should be as? Because a lot of what I'm hearing is like this was some subjective decision by the committee when it was an RFP put out by the state that had specific scoring rubrics on what should be scored. I, I'm just going off memory, but it was amount of vehicles 2016 or newer. So yeah, yeah, it's not like we just looked at cars and were like, this company is better than another company. It was specifically outlined by the state how it should be scored. Are you talking about how we calculated the actual score? Like if somebody gave them a good versus an excellent, or are you talking about the actual criteria of competence? Um, Specifically for fleet, what she was talking about. I don't have that in front of me, I don't believe. If, if I could. I, I got it, I got it. You got it? You got I it. was searching for it. All right, each offer must demonstrate in its proposal that it meets all the minimum qualifications set forth below as the date it submits its offer. Offers that do not conform to these requirements will not be considered. Possess a fleet of at least 14 vehicles of model 2016 or newer capable of carrying at least two passengers and, and any baggage, including at least 10 vehicles with no more than 125,000 miles. <clears throat> that was what was put out by the state. Now, again, that was their requirement on what it should be scored on. So I can't I can't speak to why they chose that, but that that was the question I think that was asked prior to the to all that is if you if the city's fleet is used, that's kind of void. That was the understanding, is that if the if you're supplying your own vehicles, then you have to meet those requirements. If you as a company are correct, yeah. But if you're using city vehicles, yeah, it was basically right. Not they didn't involved. have to consider our vehicles, right. Yeah, so I, I don't know if that confusion occurred during the process or not. Yeah. I will note that there was a 10-day protest period that all of this stuff could have been brought up in an official protest. Um, and that was from the date that we sent the intent to award letter on October 27th. And that 10 days would have been up on November 9th. And the, the, we did not receive an official protest. Was it, was it printed publicly? It was in the RFP. But it, well, pardon? it was in the RFP. But our understanding of the protest was having to do with some legality. But, but judgmental voting, evaluation, really isn't illegal. You know, you can question it, but it's... It really wasn't something we could, you can argue. Okay. You, you know, that, that was our understanding of, of the 10 day protest. It had to be something, a process, a process of illegality. Okay. Otherwise, you got whiners. My name is Brian Munich. I'm one of the newcomers for the taxi company. Uh, what happens here doesn't really affect me, okay? You ever think of what it affects the 30-year person, the 20-year person? 
when you got a new company coming in, we all got to get fired and rehired, lose vacation. What, what kind of benefits do we really have? Nothing. Okay. The couple of people that have vacation that, that been here for a long period of time, they lose it all. You ever think of that? You know, it's like every one of you right now, you got to start over. Any vacation you got, out the door. I've been through this twice in my lifetime already. I had companies move out on me. I had other things happen where I had to always start over. And it really sucks, especially if you got 30, 20 years in a, into a place. I watched my dad, who had 32 years in a company, the company just moved away. What does he do after 32 years? You know, this is something you also got to take in evaluation. This is a city owned, okay? These are city employees, which we're all fired. Look at it that way. We all just got fired. This city employees. Yeah, okay, I can get my job back, but to me, this doesn't matter. I get a raise, big deal. You know, I'm fighting for this crew right here. One of the best crews I think I ever met in a taxi company. Think about that next time you want to evaluate something. Think about the people that work for the company, because this sucks. It really does. I just want to know if any of you personally have gone to any of the other communities where Runnings is involved. Has anybody taken the time to go to any of the other communities, because we know they have them, and taken a taxi in their community? Or gone to call for a taxi from a different community? Has I haven't from our community or any other community. <laughs> No, well, because we all take driving mm -hmm. driving as a, mm -hmm. as we're used to it. We just jump in our cars and goes. But mm -hmm. these people, like my son, don't. So on the other side of this coin, when he has to call down to Barocqua now and say, this is Tyler, identify himself, he's going to have to relearn. He knows his home address, but he's going to have to find out what the address is of the hockey rink, what the address is of the bowling alley, what the address is of the places that he goes, which is going to take a lot of work for him to do. Not impossible, just a lot of work. And is Baroqua, the dispatchers on the other end, because they've got other communities, that, are they going to sit there on the phone with him while he's pulling a list out of his wallet to read? This is where I need to go. Are they going to understand who he is? Or are they going to be ones that are going to tell him on the phone, hey, we're really busy right now. It's going to take us 20 minutes to get there, 15 minutes to get there. They're not going to know the dispatch time. When he has called for a taxi, at least the dispatchers know who he is. They know that he can't stand out in the frigid cold, which he doesn't have the mentality to realize the temperatures sometimes, OK? And I don't want to disregard him at all, but I hope you all are understanding what I'm saying. So they'll say, no, it's going to take us 15 minutes to get there. Is it possible? Can you call your mom? And he knows to call me to come and get him. Because when the movie theater closes at 9 o'clock at night, and there are a bunch of other calls, and he's already outside. He can't even open. He can't even get back in that movie theater. He's stuck outside. But I have people back here that that watch out for him. I'm not going to have that out of Barroqua, because they don't know who he is. They've never seen his face. They've never seen the faces of a lot of these kids and these adults in this community, and that sucks. Hi, y'all. Thank you all for your time. My name's Michael Barrett. I'm a former retired business owner here in Wisconsin Rapids. We were in town for 50 years, and uh, I, I want to thank you all for your service. I'm also a former president and board member of the Wisconsin Rapids Community Theater, so I know how nonprofits work. 
Uh, I've worked for this cab company for about 16, 18 months, and uh, I, I don't have a harsh word to say about any of them. Uh, it seems that due to all the objective criteria, this is a done deal. But since we're having this meeting, it doesn't seem that way to me. The only thing I want to say is, as a person, as a member of this community, goodwill. I'd like you all to consider generating the goodwill of keeping a business local. Like I said, I was a local business owner. I know what it means to have goodwill and to serve people. So as a person, as a member of the community, please consider that if you do indeed have the opportunity to award the contract to Wheels of Independent River City Cab, because they're a great group. I enjoy working for them. I think I'm an asset, and I'd like that entity to remain here in the proud city of Wisconsin Rapids. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay. Oh. Karen, you were overseeing this RFP. We can't legally choose just who we want because they're local or we, get, we have a bunch of people who are passionate about their services. The RFP process as it is and we do in other areas of the city is specifically designated in this case by the state. It, so we wouldn't have a choice to go outside the boundaries that they set in that RFP or even go against the, what the RFP scoring was and reverse that at this time. Based we on. can, but then we would have to fund it ourselves. We wouldn't get the grant money. We wouldn't get state or federal grant money. Which is what this program runs on. Correct. We wouldn't have it otherwise. Correct. Right. I, I guess the other, I think there's just a, a misunderstanding of the RSP process in this particular RFP in general. I think we need to make those public, or the RFP public again. We can, so it can be read through. Because uh, it's being made to seem as if this was some type of choice by the council to go with Viroqua running ink over Wisconsin Rapids River City Cab based on we just like their company better. And that's not the case with an RFP. There's specific requirements and scoring that is, in this case, put out by the state to fund this. And you have to score based on that. Um, and to do anything against that would be in violation so I, I I also think there's some confusion I heard that the cab drivers are city employees if they if they were city employees there wouldn't have needed to be an RFP because RFPs don't go out for work done by government personnel so you guys are a, a contractor um, and I would hope which means your business and I would hope as a business that you guys would stick around and compete I don't know why this necessarily means you have to close the doors. I mean, there's plenty of cities with uh, multiple cab companies that compete against each other, and I'm not, I don't know enough about your business to say whether that's possible or not, but it's something that I would hope that River City Cab would consider and that they would stay in business and we would have, you know, multiple cab companies uh, and everybody that's so passionate about you would choose your business over the one that is won this RFP. So that that's kind of what I I thought would happen after I, I seen the, the notice is that you guys would stay around and compete and it sounds like that's not what the idea of the owner operators are. Um, but I hope that that can be reconsidered and that River City Cab continues to operate within the city. Yeah. Um, one second, sir. Just a second. One second. Um, regard, regarding, actually, you, you were one of the people that brought up the dollar amount. Um, one of the things, I guess, if you talk about potential flawed RFP, so as we've been discussed, and it's awarded on a point process, and as I believe you said it was 30 and 24 for price. Um, in my mind, I guess, if we look at it as, a, as we think of it in our minds of a traditional group, request for proposal bid um, I think those numbers are pretty close to each other yeah. um, 24 
30 points being for the best price and 24 points still being awarded. I mean, in my mind, maybe that, if, if we're thinking of it as terms of price being an issue, um, then that maybe 30, 20 or 30, 15, something to that effect. But I'm saying the state is basically set, the DOT has set this number. They still awarded 24 points to the um, bidder with the lower, with the higher price. And um, I guess that's kind of a, to me, that's kind of a flawed number. But if you're looking at it surely for price, so I'm not sure where their theory came up with that. I mean, if, if price was that critical to the state, and apparently it's not. So th it seems to me that the state is more less concerned about the your tax dollars <laughs> or our tax dollars in this regard than the city employee or the council is, because they still awarded 24 points to the higher price bid. So thank you. Okay. Go ahead, sir. They uh, now you sat there and said we should start our own business and go in competition with them, right? We have no business. I've got to hope that we Okay. You want to do something for the community? Sign the titles off to these city-owned vehicles that didn't matter during this thing. Sign them off to us employees. Let, them, let us give them a run for their money. And let's see <clears throat> who stays on top. Because I've heard rumors that they love to go into a community. They are going to decrease the number of fleet vehicles. They're going to increase the customer's rates. And, oh, by the way, you're going to have a wait time that is going to be insane. We have 16, 16 city vehicles that we're out there running daily. We are striving to keep this city moving. 16 of them. Okay? They want to try and do it with 10 vans, plus new wheelchairs on top of it. Marshfield. I went up there. Their cabs run a minimum, a minimum, people, of two hours behind. Two! Do you know what that'll do to 90% of our customers? They will no longer have jobs. You just costed 280 jobs with this decision. Can you live with that? That's just bare minimum. Shane, um, I guess I'm going to change the question around a little bit here, but uh, I got an email, I think we all got an email from the school district, and what is the process with um, the cab vouchers? You know, does Running Inc. honor those vouchers yet that have been previously purchased? I think you had punch cards and vouchers and things like that, and so what's going to happen with those? Because obviously the school district's concerned that uh, a lot of those were purchased with grant dollars, and purchased ahead of time, and I'm kind of curious to know what's going to happen with those. Yep. Running Inc. will honor the punch cards and the prepaid vouchers um, as long as that revenue was recognized at the time of the sale. And Jim has told me that that revenue has been recognized, so they will honor those punch cards and vouchers. Thank you. Uh, Ken Porter once again, and Jay and Zach know I, I can't be quiet, so uh, here I am again. Kind of looking like this might be a done deal. I'm hoping not, but it looks like this might be a done deal. And since Jim, Jim opened the door to, for, to thanking people, um, I, I guess I want to thank someone also. Jim's been our, uh, our manager for quite a while. And I want to let you know what, you, what, what you're kind of giving up, what you're kind of throwing away here. I asked Jim to put this together for me. Uh, there are six associations on these documents, all of which Jim was a participant in and a member of. One of them he was president, another he's an officer, another he's treasurer, secretary. Jim also runs the rodeo program, 
which is a one to two day training involving classroom driver safety topics along with an on-hands driver training course. Not only do you have an employee here and a good manager, but you've got an ambassador for our city. Somebody, somebody that is very knowledgeable, goes out and learns more, brings it back here, takes it to, takes it to the rest of the people in the state. Uh, so, so if this is a done deal, I'm, hoping it's, I'm still hoping it's not, but if this is a done deal, I, I want to thank Jim and everybody here, but I, I guess in particular because uh, Jim's been working with us for a long time. In discussing these, these matters with Jim, I, was, I asked him to give me some time one day, and I sat down in front of him at his desk. I said, hey, I know you've got to take a lot of phone calls, so you take those calls. I'll just sit here and wait. I'm just an old retired guy. Jim took a call. He was on the phone for seven or eight minutes. The client on the other end was not understanding stuff, but in that seven or eight minutes, Jim mentioned six or seven knowledgeable things that no one else would know. He was patient, empathetic with this person, and again, here we are. We, we're talking black and white here, I guess, and there I go again. We're talking black and white, and I'm trying to stay away from the, you know, from the, from the hoorahs here, but I can't. So just that experience, and, and that happens every day, several times a day. Lisa does the same thing. The other thing is, and, and again, not, not bragging about us board members, but you have a five-member board that oversees this organization. Two of us have extensive transportation experience, two bankers, and our, chair, our, our president is, is, a, is an attorney. So there's excellent oversight of this organization and has for a number of years. That's why we've been, not the board members, the staff, but we've been very efficient. And again, here I, here I go to the subjectivity, trying to stay away from that, but I can't help myself. So hopefully this is not a done deal. Please give it consider, consideration. And Mr. Catnall, we'd be happy to compete. If you can, would you help us uh, convince the DOT to give us half of the grant funding? And then, then I th I'm, I'm confident we can compete with our service and how we run our organization. We just need some funding. So if there's any loophole that we can go and get, I, and I know there's not. I'm, I'm talking silly here a little bit. But, but you mentioned compete. We can't compete without funds. So if you can convince the DOT to give us half that money, we, we'd be happy to you know, give you a second taxi service in this city because we're proud of what we do. Our staff would love to do it for you. And uh, I guess I'll leave it at that. Sorry, sorry for uh, babbling on. Thank you. I think that would be a question for your state representative about how to change that DOT process. I'd I'll sit next to you when you call him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mr. Kruger, Mr. Teston. But uh, I get, I, as far as options or whether or not it's a done deal, I guess when I look at what they really are to us, it's to throw the RFP out, not accept state funds. You, you would have to operate your business. I don't think Running Inc. would come then. That's an option. Um, but if we are going to take in state funds, we do have to follow their set RFP rules. So, I mean, it, I wouldn't say we, we wouldn't be open to the, that. The city doesn't have money to put funding for it. This has always came from the state. But if you guys would want to operate as a business on your own and we turn down the money and don't take in running ink. I, I'm not sure what that looks like for you guys, but um, again, this is all within the RFP process, and that would be an option as we could just not take state funding for transportation, and then I don't even think they'd come here and you guys could operate as a business. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Amelia Franklin. Um, I live at 511 Third Street South. I've been a employee of River City Cab and Wheels of Independence for 19 years. Um, again, like others have mentioned, it sounds like this is a done deal. Um, and I would like to know what might happen if they don't get enough employees. Um, because I myself um, am not pleased with the deal I was given as an option for an em for employment uh, when I if if this deal hadn't gone through um, and I was staying with wheels of independence in River City cab um, I would have gotten a much better deal as far as uh, 
you know, uh, hourly wage and vacation. Um, and I would not be getting that with running. So I feel at this point in time, it's not in my best interest to uh, be an employee of running. Uh, so what would happen if they do not get enough employees? They would probably pull drivers and vehicles from surrounding areas. So keeping it local. Nice, okay. Because, um, like I said, I, I at this point in time, I don't think it's in my best interest to, to go with them. I am going to seek employment other, other places if this goes through. Um, I wish at this point in time that something could be changed because I don't think this is fair. I don't think it's fair for to bring in somebody from out of the community uh, who does not know this community like we do and uh, have a relationship with many people in the community like we do. We're talking physically disabled, developmentally disabled, and other individuals that rely on our services and have relied on the relationship that we have built with them. Like I said, I've been an employee for a long time. I know many of the people here. I've been in I've been a member of this community since I was born. I'm going to be 50 in April, so I've been around a long time. Uh, I love this community, and I hate to see this happen. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Is there a representative from Runnings here tonight? I'm not. You're not yet. <laughs> we heard from you. There is a gentleman behind. I certainly would like to hear from you, and I have a few questions for you. Sure. Go ahead. One time. My name is Justin Running. I'm with Running Incorporated, and I live in uh, Barroqua. My name is Justin Running. I'm with Running Incorporated, and I do live in Barroqua, as mentioned. So just a couple things. Um, one, uh, this transition. <clears throat> can, you, can you explain how you're going to do this? Um, I, I have had several phone calls to people that are concerned that this is their only source of transportation. And yep. um, if this is going to happen, this has to be seamless. Yeah. So today I spent, um, I arrived in town today at a little before 10 o'clock. I spent the day meeting with uh, prospective employees, mo many of whom are in the room tonight. Um, we interviewed, hired, and began the uh, pre-employment process with 18 individuals. Um, there's a few folks that couldn't meet today. We'll be coming back later this week and then again next week to meet with those individuals. Um, I know most of them are working, so we'll work around their schedules to, in terms of training. How do we get them trained up? You know, how do we get ready for the transition after the first of the year? Um, and, and that's really the, the transition period. There's a lot of training that has to happen. There's a lot of you know, late hours, people working together, learning, you know, the ropes, because the service can't stop, right? The service runs through the end of the year. We take over right after the beginning of the year. Um, we've done it in multiple cities. There are times that, you know, depending on how the new onboarding process, you know, we've met with folks, we've told them what their pay is going to be. We've talked about how we operate. We've talked about my expectations of, as a company. Um, Sometimes they get work in there for a couple of days and decide, you know what, it's not for them. And then you have to start looking for new people. So we'll continue to advertise, continue to expand our employment pool. But it's really uh, just getting focused before the ha beforehand, getting the schedules built, getting people committed to be in on work. And as long as everybody that has been offered a position comes in, trains, and shows up for work, which I have no doubt that they won't. They all have been wonderful people today to work with. Um, there's a lot of hard questions. A lot of folks had some concerns. We talked through most of them. Um, you've heard some of them again tonight. 
and um, we'll just work through it. We'll have staff on the ground here. Our regional manager that'll be taking care of this, like on a operational standpoint, is from Marshfield. He's got family here in Rapids. He's here on a regular basis, and he'll, you know, he'll he'll be here. I'll be here, and we'll just keep a close eye on it. All right. What about the wait times? Um, the number of um, vehicles that you're running at any one time. Um, can you address that? Sure. So when you look at your RFP, you put out a detailed hour, you know, how many vehicles per hour. Our bid was based at looking at what the city had asked for. So when you look, I don't have that particular document in front of me, but I believe maximum amount of vehicles on midday is 14, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so we, we plan on staffing as asked for in the RFP. As we get moving, and if we see operational efficiencies, if we've got too many vehicles on midday and we need to shift some earlier, shift some later, or as the staff comes on and we talk about building the schedule, they say, gosh, we usually only have 11 on during the, this time, we have seven on this time, we'll work with the city staff to say, you know, I know this is what your table in your RFP said, but this is what we're hearing from the staff. How do you want us to react to that? All right, that's it for now. Thank you. Absolutely. Any other questions? Thank you, sir. Sure. If, if, Go ahead. Yep. So there, it was mentioned about dispatch out of Roqua, and I don't know if, if any of you are aware or not, but we're actually, we'll be leasing the same space that uh, this current cab operator is operating in. We'll have dispatch here in town. We're hoping to hire on as many of the current staff, keep most of the folks in terms of a continuity of service. That's very important, and we are interested in that. What about the lady that mentioned her son? I mean, it's... I, this is, and I'm hoping to be able to meet her in the hallway after we're done because I have some questions regarding that too. There's been nobody that's approached. We haven't had any positions other than drivers and dispatcher positions available that we've had posted. We typically don't have extra folks, but actually her son was mentioned in an interview today and it was very intriguing that they have an individual come in, clean the cars, and I'd love to meet with them, so I'm glad they're here tonight so we can talk with them after the meeting. This was... Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Heard a lot of comments uh, tonight that, uh, you know, this is a done deal and there's nothing uh, the council can do. I don't uh, subscribe to that conclusion. I think that, uh, you know, the check and the balance on this award is still a board approval uh, by the full council. If expediency is going to be the factor that we're going to go forward with, obviously it is a done deal. But expediency shouldn't be what we be guided by. It's going to take quite an inward look by the city to look at what happened here and admit that maybe we as a city, we as a uh, committee could have done things differently. Maybe we didn't understand the process like we should have. Maybe we scored uh, in a flawed fashion. As, as Lisa pointed out, we were penalized for our fleet, but the fleet is owned by the city. I mean, how can we be penalized for our fleet when when you're the ones that give us the fleet. Uh, I mean, I think there was uh, certainly enough issues here that demonstrate that maybe we made a mistake. And I can't believe that that mistake can't be rectified by this council having the courage to s admit that maybe we could have done things better. And maybe we have to start the process over. And maybe uh, if we do, uh, things will be different. I certainly hope they will be. Thank you for your attention and consideration. My name is Douglas Heiser. I live at 1623 30th Street North. I have been a driver who pushes wheelchairs. I am one of the two wheelchair van drivers for River City Cab. The people in this town in wheelchairs have gotten bigger. They are way much more. 
I do, on average day, 15 to 20 wheelchair runs alone. I don't take ambulatory passengers. I know every facility. I know most of the CNAs at every nursing home and group home in this town. I have to wait sometimes for these people to be gotten ready. I am efficient. My passengers love me. And my 17 years of experience, when I talked to running's application guy, application lady, meant nothing. My three weeks of vacation I get a year means nothing. I get don't get it anymore. That should be in that RFP. What are your current employees who will possibly come to you going to get for their time and effort? Because trust me, there are ladies in this town who I take to church almost every Sunday. They love me. Why? Because I'm nice to them, I'm kind to them, I'm considerate to them, and I take things into consideration from them. I don't see a car. Uh, uh, trust me. I know Runnings, a former Runnings employee from Marshfield. The man's a friend of mine, good friend of mine. <laughs> yeah, I heard about the horror stories about Marshfield Cab. <laughs> I know them. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, We've heard everybody out at this point. What are the wishes of the committee? I agree with um, Mr. Bender, who said we have to get it in front of the council. It's going to be judged by the entire council. So to move this forward, to get it in front of the council, I make a motion to approve the contract for the shared ride contract. I'll second the motion. Any other questions or comments? Seeing none, I move to a vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Nay. Ayes have it two to, two to one, Bemke being the one voting nay. Item three, consider a request from the Community Development Department to utilize $50,000 in tax increment District 7 for the creation of a downtown development master plan. I'll take a moment before we start. If, if, yeah, if you guys want to depart, I'll give you a few minutes. Thank you for your time. Uh, at this point in time, we're going to take a five-minute uh, recess to rest. Meant to utilize sure um, all right item number five consider a request from eway sales llc Doing business as eWay Sales, Jonathan Reuter, agent located at 2660 8th Street South, number 105, for renewal of pawnbroker, secondhand article dealer, and secondhand jewelry dealer licenses. Questions, comments? I guess the only question I would have is he, it, would he, if he'd like to get up and say anything, otherwise I'll make a motion to approve. You're good. All right, so Bemke made a motion to approve. Second. Veneman seconded it. Any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move to vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Ayes have it three to zero. Thank you. All right, going back to <laughs> item three. Consider a request from the Community Development Department to utilize $50,000 in tax increment District 7 for the creation of a downtown development master plan. Kyle, thanks for your patience. 
No problem. So this item is back before you uh, because the, uh, the council acted previously to postpone action on this until such time that the grant that grant that was applied for uh, for the County uh, Economic Development Committee was approved and that happened in November. So the county did award the city $25,000 uh, to couple with um, hopefully $50,000 out of the TIF, downtown TIF district for the update to the downtown master plan. So I I've, I've brought this back to you guys for the earmarking of those dollars or approval of those dollars out of the TIF along with uh, an updated memo identifying again our recommended procedure and process as well as a kind of a breakdown, a timeline, um, and kind of a detailed sheet identifying our hybrid approach. So I think we can reduce some of the costs for the master plan if we as staff in our department pursue the public engagement component. Uh, we'll handle all the, you know, the meetings, we'll do the online surveys, we'll right, engage with the public, um, and I think we can save some costs, and then we'll rely on a consultant to do more of the, the detailed renderings, drawings, and mappings. And the hope is that that, that would be um, at or under $75,000. There's always a plan that if the RFP is released that you know, we don't have um, anything below that amount which could trigger uh, additional requests out of the TIF. Um, I don't foresee that happening. I think with our hybrid approach, we can, uh, we can make it manageable with that $75,000 project costs. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions regarding this. Um, again, won't, won't get into many of the details as I think I've provided them regarding the plan a few times already. Questions, comments? No, I'll make a motion to approve. Good job getting the 25. <laughs> second. I got a motion by Veneman, seconded by Bemke to approve. Any questions or comments? For the 50,000? 50, to come from the TIF, yeah. The 50,000 to come from the TIF. Right, downtown TIF District 7. All right, seeing no questions or comments, I move to vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Ayes have it three to zero. Item four, consider a request to amend the Community Development Department fee schedule. Kyle. Thank you. So there's really three items that um, we continue to do within our office uh, that take a substantial amount of time. And many other communities charge a fee for it. We do not, uh, but I think it's outside of the scope of you know general assistance to um, citizens. One of which is a zoning verification letter. So a lot of times, a title company or a bank will ask us to write a letter, sign it. Sometimes even do a more in-depth review, uh, looking at property history, any existing code cases, and then provide a summary of those. Uh, we don't charge currently a fee for that, uh, but again, it can take up some substantial time. And so I'd like to try to offset some of that time with a fee. So we're recommending uh, for a letter, a $25 fee for a more intense review. Again, oftentimes banks will ask for these. Uh, we're, we're requesting a $50 per hour fee. Something like the paper mill could take several hours to sift through, scan documents. Uh, but most of the time it'd be at or under that $50, $50 fee. We also have a section of our zoning code that uh, allows for setback averaging to be done in a case where you have, let's say, a property owner that wants to rip off a front porch, put on a new front porch, but their current home doesn't meet the required 25-foot setback. We can do what's called a setback average and take um, an average of the setbacks for existing homes within a 300-foot radius and apply it to that construction project. Right now, we don't charge for that. That also takes a substantial amount of time where we have to do a buffer. We have to measure online. We have to you know, average those out. We now don't, um, don't charge for that. And it's based on projects, right? So if somebody wants to do a project, um, they could request the setback average as part of that project. So for the fee for that, we're, uh, uh, we're requesting a $50 fee. And then for certified survey maps, 
We do have a fee structure right now that's based off of lot, um, but it's a little bit confusing. It, you know, it's $50 plus $10 per lot, so if you have one lot, it's $60. I think it's a lot easier just to do a flat fee of $75, and then um, we don't currently identify uh, lot line adjustments, sales or transfers, which are regulated by the state. Um, we can charge a fee for them. We can't necessarily deny, uh, deny a request, but it, it's a lot easier to look at an existing parcel and if they're moving a lot line or a neighbor buys three feet so they could you know, put an addition on their shed, something like that would only cost $25. So it's really these three items that we're requesting to be included in the fee schedule. I do also want to note that I think next year uh, we'll probably come back with maybe a more comprehensive review of our fee schedule. It hasn't been updated in about five years, and I think um, you know there there are other ways we can clean up some of our permits and stuff, and maybe have a flat fee uh, instead of requiring you know based off of square footage or value just to make it a little bit easier on the citizenry. Uh, with that being said, we'd recommend your approval of those three amendments. Questions, comments? Mr. Delaney? Is this a, a service separate from a public records request? The zoning verification letter? Uh, anything that you have listed on here, is that separate from? It, it can be one and the same. A lot of times, like banks, they only want to know, are there any open code violations? Are there any... Um, open building permits, are there any open um, you know, zoning violations, and then they want to know the zoning, the use, is it legal non-conforming, non-conforming, legal conforming. So a lot of it relates to zoning, um, but there are instances where we have individuals submit an open letters request and it has several components. So we'll, uh, several departments will respond, engineering, our office, um, fire department. Um, for those, we can charge based on the lowest rate of the hourly employee that can do it. So it's, it's aligned to match that same structure which is set by the state. Now, that was my question because public records, they have a, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that they have a um, fee schedule on there that you, ha you cannot go over Correct. to keep it low for people yep. looking for uh, public records. Um, and and this does match that you're saying? Uh, it's, it's somewhat aligned to do so. Ours is particularly relating to zoning information and code enforcement and building. Like sometimes people will say, I want all the building permits for a building. And sometimes their stack is this big. So we have to scan those that information. It may not be an open records request unless they submit it through the open records you know, means through the clerk's office, it may just be a request and we may say, well, it's gonna cost you $50 or it's gonna cost you 25, depending on the, the request. Um, but it does align very similarly with, uh, with an open records request where we can charge, I believe for open records, it's, um, we can charge hourly for the lowest salaried employee that can do the open records request, I believe is how the state structures it. Is that correct, Jennifer? I believe that's correct. I would have to look that up to verify it, but I believe that's that's usually what the clerk's office does is the lowest um, lowest paid person that would work on the request. Thank you. I might have missed this part, but how many of these are new? So currently we're charging for a certified survey map. Uh, setback averages are new and the zoning verification letters are, are new fees. So everything in red? Yes, so the again the CSMs you can see are already being charged at $50, $50 plus $10 per lot. We're requesting just to change that to a flat $75 fee. Okay, who do you think this affects most? More like banks or? Zoning verification letters will be buyers, banks, title companies. Um, the CSMs will be property owners or surveyors. You know, the surveyor might 
put this fee onto the property owner. Usually they'll cover it and then they'll just increase their, their cost. Um, certified survey map fees you'll find in every community. Uh, zoning verification letters typically in, in every community. Uh, the setback averaging is more unique to our zoning code. Um, again, I, I think charging a fee is reasonable because it's based on an owner wanting to do a project. And that owner can either meet the standards, the setback that's required in the zoning district, or if they want, they can ask us to you know, put in more time and effort to try to come up with a zoning um, or setback average that could reduce their uh, setback from the standard. So everyone who wants to do a project is going to have to come pay, uh, what is it, 50 bucks, 25 bucks? Well, right now we're doing find the, out their right now we're doing the service for free. You could argue that if we're so you're doing time to do a setback average, it's taking us away from doing something else. Okay. Right, and so we're not charging a fee for this service, but we charge fees for building permits. We charge fees for all of our plan commission items, and it's based off of the applicant making the request because they're they're getting something in return. Right now we're doing the service ultimately. Can you give me an example of the what you a setback? Averaging project you guys would take up a homeowner. I somewhat did already. I'll, I'll use the same example. So you have a property owner. They live in an existing neighborhood. Let's say they've got a, a deck on their property that's you know, falling apart that currently meets a 20-foot setback. It's 20 feet from the sidewalk. They want to rip it off. The zoning code says now you you, you have to have a 25-foot setback. Well, then they can't reconstruct their deck that's failing we can apply a setback average where we look at the entire uh, area within 300 foot around the property and we measure every home within that 300 foot buffer. We add them up and we divide by the number in that, that buffer area to get an average. Usually that average comes in a lot lower than the 25 foot setback requirement. So it might be 16 feet, it might be 18 feet. So now that property owner that could not reconstruct their deck might be able to reconstruct their deck by applying a setback average. And it, it, these, these are mostly in existing neighborhoods, developed older neighborhoods that don't meet the setbacks. So they make a smaller deck after they've paid. They get to use a less setback. So again, if, the, if, if, it was a, if their home was set back at 20 feet, their deck, they rip it off. The, the, the current code we have says they now have to construct it at 25, but they can't because their home's there. So now they wouldn't be able to reconstruct their deck. Well, if we do a setback average and the average comes in at 16 feet, well, 16 is less than 20. Now they can reconstruct their deck at their original or even encroach further and do it larger in some instances. Okay. It, it's basically flexibility uh, within the zoning ordinance to allow for reduced setbacks. That's yeah. property specific. Yeah, and this is just about the fees, so I won't get into the ordinance, but that, those are the questions I have. Wishes? Any other questions or comments? What are your wishes? I'll move to approve the amended Community Development Department fee schedule. I got a motion by Bemke. Second. Second by Veneman. Questions or comments? Seeing none, I move to a vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Although I, all those opposed, say nay. I just have it three to zero. Um, item six. Thank you, Kyle. Five. Five. I'm sorry. So, so we did five because um, Jonathan was here. Jonathan Ruder, uh, Bemke made a motion to approve. Veneman seconded it and it passed three to zero. Thank you. You're welcome. Item six, consider a request from GameStop Inc. doing business as Games GameStop 3254 Mark Heyman Robinson agent located at 930 Coon Avenue for renewal of a second hand article dealer license. Jennifer, good. Um, questions, comments? Seeing none, what are your wishes? Move to approve. Got a motion by Veneman. Second. Second by Bemke to approve. 
questions or comments? Seeing none, I move to vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Ayes have it three to zero. Item seven, out of the bills, we will be tabling that until next month. Item eight, set next meeting date. January 2nd, does anybody have any concerns? So January 2nd, 2025. Four. Four, four. sorry, I got a year ahead. 2024. <laughs> you extended your term. Four, yeah. <laughs> Don't extend At four o'clock. That's enough of that. <laughs> All right. Item nine. In open session, the committee may vote to go into closed session under section 19.851E of the Wisconsin statutes, which reads, deliberating, deliberating or negotiating the purchase of public properties, the investing of public funds, or conducting other specified public business whenever competitive or bargaining reasons require a closed session. In closed session, the committee will discuss negotiations and strategy regarding an agreement with the Heart of Wisconsin Chamber of Commerce for Economic Development and other services. What are your wishes? I'll move to go into closed session. Second. I had a motion by Bemke, seconded by Benjamin to go into Veneman, sorry, to go into closed session. We are now in closed session. 